Visiting the Holy Land was an amazing experience. And Marilyn and I can't thank you enough for making it possible for us to walk where Jesus walked and sail where Paul went on his missionary journeys. You know, it's, it's impossible to convey the feeling you get knowing that you may be in the exact place where Jesus turned water into wine, preached the Sermon on the Mount, fed 5,000, calmed the sea, and healed the lame, let alone where he was betrayed, tried, crucified, arose, and ascended into heaven. You know, many have said going to the Holy Land is a life-changing experience. But I wouldn't put it that way. The truly life-changing experience doesn't take place when you walk where Jesus walked. It takes place when you let him walk into your life. When you accept him as your Lord and Savior. And don't get me wrong, going to the Holy Land is wonderful. And if you ever get the opportunity to go, by all means, go. But you do not have to visit Israel to understand who Jesus is and what he's done for you. Now, before we left for the Holy Land, we concluded our study in John's Gospel. This morning, we begin a study of his letters in which he continues making certain that we do have a clear understanding of who Christ is. We begin with 1 John, the longest of his epistles, but all three are relatively brief, and they all address problems that the early church was facing because the truth about Jesus who he was and is and must be in our life, was being challenged. Now, we can't be positive on the date or even the sequence of John's writings. When With Paul, we have the the book of Acts to guide us, but our knowledge of John's later ministry comes only from tradition and early church historians. The evidence is strong that John spent the last 30 years or so of his life in Ephesus, ministering to the churches that Paul had established on his missionary journeys in Asia Minor some years earlier. Ephesus, which a major city, with quite possibly a population of 200,000 or more, and Marilyn and I were just there. Or I should say we were at the 10% of its ruins that had been excavated and somewhat restored. The churches in Asia Minor were plagued with factions and heresies even while Paul was alive, and things had only gotten worse by the time John went there. In fact, he probably went there because as the last of the apostles, he was needed there more than anywhere else. From Ephesus, John could keep his finger on what was happening in all the churches of Asia. And his first letter was apparently intended to circulate among all of them. Now, as I mentioned, we can't be certain of the sequence of John's writings. Most suggest he first wrote the gospel and then the letters and Revelation. It is possible, however, that 1 John was a cover letter for the gospel of John. Both touch on similar themes, and he spells out in the letter why he's writing. He's writing because false teachers were trying to deceive the early Christians, men who had been part of the church, but who had bought into the Gnostic philosophies of the day were trying to incorporate their views into Christianity. Their views were similar to those of theologians today who try to make Jesus acceptable in a pluralistic, morally relative, postmodern world, who present him as only one of a multitude of acceptable choices, who offer his views of morality as being good, but not absolute, and who see Jesus as meeting a spiritual need in our lives, but deny that he's necessary for all who would be saved. 
the false teachers of 2,000 years ago were doing the same thing. They were explaining away the true nature of Christ because it didn't fit into their new worldview. But in doing so, they were explaining away the gospel message. They thought they were in the know, and Gnostic comes from the word to know. In their quest for knowledge, they had lost the truth. So John wrote his gospel to teach the truth and his letters to open his readers up to the truth. He wanted all Christians to know the truth and to be certain they knew it. Since the only way to spot a counterfeit is to know the real thing, John focused on the truths we could know, actually using the word know, K-N-O-W, 39 times in this short letter. John wants us to know the truth. Truth about our relationship to God, to the world, and to each other. And the only way for those relationships to be as God desires is for us to first come to a clear understanding of Christ, who he is, what he's done, and what he expects of us. That understanding is foundational to Christianity. So if your understanding of Christ is compromised by heresy, you risk losing everything. Obviously, John did have a proper understanding of Christ, and he longed to share it with his readers. He makes that clear in the introduction to his first letter. What was from the beginning, what we have heard and what we have seen with our eyes, what we beheld with our hands, handled, our hands handled concerning the word of life. And the word was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested to us. What we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you also that you may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write so that our joy may be made complete. John had it. What was from the beginning? What we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we beheld and our hands handled concerning the word of life. John had a complete understanding of Christ. What he heard and saw led him into a deep understanding of Christ. And he expressed it in both his letters and his gospel. And the similarity between the first verses of 1 John and the gospel of John is hard to miss. And in fact, that similarity led to one of the funniest things that ever happened in class at Bible College. Now, John's letters are written in the simplest of Greek, so they're often used in Greek classes. And one day we were told to open our Greek New Testaments to 1 John and be ready to translate. A friend of mine who was asked to begin began confidently. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. It sounded really good, but there was a problem there. He wasn't translating 1 John, he was quoting from the Gospel of John. As we began to realize what he was doing, and for some of us it did take a while, the class fell apart in laughter. The similarity between the opening words of John's Gospel and his first letter had exposed our classmate as a better memorizer of Scripture than translator. Anyway, both John and 1 John begin at the very beginning. And as Mary Poppins taught us to sing, that's a very good place to start. If you're going to understand something, you must begin at the beginning. Now, I hate to come in on the middle of a TV program, and Marilyn hates for me to do so, because I ruin it for her by constantly asking questions because I don't know what's going on. 
You know, I think most people are like that. They really don't know what's going on because they have no knowledge of the beginning. John had intimate knowledge of what was from the beginning. From the beginning of Christ's ministry and even from the beginning of everything. Now, obviously, John hadn't been at the beginning of everything, but he had heard about it. God revealed what happened in the beginning to Moses in the book of Genesis, and John had read it. But even more, his eyes did see what was from the beginning, even before the beginning, because he had seen the Creator. You know, God revealed himself to mankind as a man, and John had seen Jesus with his own eyes. Make no mistake, Jesus was the creator who came to earth in human form. John makes that very clear in the opening verses of his gospel. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being by him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has not come into being. John saw the eternal creator with his own eyes when he saw Jesus. And he didn't just see him, he beheld him, he says. The word means to gaze upon something that's spectacular. We get the word theater from it. And John didn't just behold Jesus, he beheld Jesus in action. He didn't just see a man who claimed to be the Son of God. He saw what he did. He was there when Jesus healed the sick, when he fed the 5,000, when he commanded the wind and the waves, and when he arose from the dead. And he not only saw and beheld the risen Christ, he had actually handled the risen Christ. He touched him. Him. He embraced him. It was no phantom, no figment of his imagination. His understanding of Christ wasn't built on empty speculation. He had heard, seen, beheld, and handled the word of life. So John had a clear understanding of Christ, and he proclaimed it. The life was manifested. And we have seen and bear witness and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested to us. In his gospel, John wrote, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. Here, John says, the word of life was manifested, was made visible in the person of Christ. And he had actually seen the word of life, the author of life, the source of eternal life. And he had not only seen it, he had borne witness to it. He testified openly to what he had seen, as did the rest of the apostles. Now, when Peter was ordered to stop preaching, he said, we cannot stop speaking what we have seen and heard. They weren't sharing their thoughts and philosophies with the world. They were sharing their intimate knowledge of Christ. They were proclaiming the eternal life that they had seen and heard. And they were proclaiming what they had been commissioned to preach by the risen Christ. They were proclaiming the good news that the eternal Christ had come to earth to make it possible for sinful, condemned men to share in his life and to share in his life Forever. That was the message John proclaimed. And he proclaimed it so we could share in it. 
what we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you also that you may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write so that our joy may be made complete. Haven't you found that the joy of an experience isn't complete until you share it? I know I'm really looking forward to tonight. Because sharing our pictures from the Holy Land with you will make the joy of our trip complete. The same was true for John. His joy wouldn't be complete until he had shared what he had seen and heard, not because he wanted to impress anyone. He wasn't looking for an opportunity to brag about all he had done. He proclaimed what he had seen and heard so others could have fellowship with him, so they could share in his experiences with him. You know, I like the Navy definition of fellowship. Two fellows in the same ship. <laughs> and if you do have Fellowship, you, you do have fellowship when you invite someone into the boat with you. Now tonight, I can only let you into the boat vicariously because you weren't there. But John wants us to really see and hear what he experienced with Christ. But how? We weren't there. We wish we had been there and had beheld and handled the word of life. But we can't do that. Or can we? Indeed, we can. We can still hear and even see Jesus. And John affirms that by the verb tenses he used. When John wrote, what we beheld and our hands handled, he used the aorist tense, indicating past, completed action. It was something he did, but could no longer do. Jesus was gone. But when he said, what we have heard and seen, he used the perfect tense, showing continual action. He could still listen to Jesus. He could still see him. And so can we. In fact, hearing and seeing Jesus is the basis for Christian fellowship. It's being in the same ship together with Jesus. It's being with him in spirit and thereby knowing him personally. It's hearing him in his word. It's talking to him in prayer. And it's seeing him at work here and now. That is the basis of Christian fellowship. Fellowship with believers and with God. But we start with Jesus. For without a proper understanding of who he is and what he has done, we can never enter into fellowship with God or eternal fellowship with each other. You know, if we think Jesus to be nothing more than a good man, a master teacher, and perhaps even a miracle worker, we'll never trust him enough to make him our Savior and Lord. It's only when we understand that he is the eternal word of life who came to earth in the flesh and who died to pay the penalty for the sin that separates us from our heavenly father, that we can be brought back into fellowship with God and into fellowship with each other. What we believe about Jesus is vitally important. Our faith cannot be built on hearsay evidence or the religious ponderings of philosophers and theologians. 
Our faith must be built on the witness of those who actually beheld and handled Jesus while on earth and on our shared experience of listening to Christ and seeing him at work in our lives and in the lives of others. Sometimes we lose sight of the fact that Jesus is involved in everything we do. If we invite him in and ask him to be involved, this whole trip that Marilyn and I just went on I see the finger of God in every aspect of it. I didn't plan it. I didn't think, oh, this is a goal I have. You all saw that and gave it to us as a gift. I think God put that on your hearts. I didn't know how to contract a trip. I was told on Sunday, you're going. Now pick it out. Monday morning, I kind of knew what I wanted to do. I wanted to do it all if I'm going to do it. And I started looking, and I found the perfect itinerary. I'd never heard of uh, America Israel tours. It looked good. And then I looked over there, and I saw that they were all sold out, except for one trip, which is going to be in a month or two. I booked it. Marilyn said, what would you do? I felt it was right. I felt it was right. And then one thing after another on the trip was absolutely amazing. I could see the hand of God at work. One little detail after. He's not not a God who's far away from us. He's a God who's here. Who cares for the details of our life. I didn't know what I was going to preach. You know, I, when I finished John, I thought, well, i got to go to 1 John. And I didn't want to start that before I left, so Mark graciously said, okay, I'll fill in another week for you. And I roughed through a sermon a little bit. And then this week I got back and started looking at it. I said, oh, God, this is perfect. This is perfect. He knows. We just have to be aware of his presence in our life. We have to trust that God is here, that Jesus is here. We have the evidence of those who actually saw him and touched him and beheld him, embraced him, and died because of their faith. And we have a God who listens to us as we pray, a God who speaks to us through his word, a God who works within the body of believers, his church. We have a God who loves us. And the only message we have to share with the world is just that. I was pretty depressed today. I read an article in the the State Journal talking about chaplains. I don't know if you read it. You know, chaplains are there to comfort people in the hospital or in a time of facing death and so forth. And I'd read several months ago that the president of the chaplain's organization was an atheist. I thought, how stupid is that? What does he have to say? Well, this article is going on about how a good percentage of chaplains, they don't even believe. They just want to say what you want to hear, what you need to hear, what will make you feel good as you go through the passages of life and and reaffirm what what makes you comfortable in, in hard times. That's hogwash. The only hope we have is in Christ. And if we don't understand who he is and what he's done and what he's doing, we have nothing. Don't be deceived. Well, I went off script. (laughs) If you've been following along, it's gone. But John wants us to know the truth about Jesus. And in order to know it, we can get excited and we can encourage each other, but we've got to be in the Word to know it. And so we're going to study hard. We're going to keep studying. 
We're going to muscle our way through John's letters. His last two are really little. We'll do it in a day or so. Then we're going to hit Revelation. And we're going to, we're going to share in the visions that God gave him of the future and of the promise we have in Christ. And tonight you're going to see where that took place. I actually put my hand where John put his hand in the wall because he was so old he had a hard time getting up. And so did I. <laughs> You're going to see it tonight. It's amazing. It's amazing. We've got to know who Jesus is. And we begin by simply turning our eyes on Jesus. And we can do that now as we stand